So Monish started off his career as an entrepreneur starting his company at company Transtech in the early 1990s, later sold it and invested that money to, and eventually created an investment partnership with some of his other friends. He started off investing their money and then realized he wanted to change the model a little bit, started his own hedge fund. And now he's giving a lot of that back through his foundation, Dr. Chana Foundation. And the fourth highlight of his career is, I believe, Manish, tell me if I get this wrong, but a couple of years ago, he was kicked out of several casinos in Vegas for blackjack. Is that right, Manish? One. We've been kicked out of one so far. One. Yeah. My, my goal is to get kicked out of all of them, but we'll do it a little, a little by little. Okay. So, but, all right. Well, I did get some questions for some people who unfortunately couldn't make it today. We do have some people on Zoom and obviously we have all of you here today. So, you know, Monish, how do you want to do this? Do you have a monologue? Do you want to go right into Q&A? How do you think we should go about this? I think, I think let's, we don't have that much time. I think let's go with the Q&A format. I think that's a good way to go. See Perfect. what uh, you guys have on your mind. Perfect. So let's hear it. What do you guys have on your mind? Tiger. If I recall correctly, Micron is 37% of your funds decision, right? The Micron is not 37%. Uh, basically, all the holdings don't get reported. Like the 13F doesn't report our foreign holdings and so on. We don't, I don't invest more than 10% of assets into anything. Yeah. So when we made the investment into Micron, it was a 10% bet. It had become maybe, I think at the peak, it was maybe 25% or so a bet and it's pulled back. So it might be like around 20 or a little less than that. I'm just wondering because I pitched a stock. I did a stock pitch on AMD. And I've just done a lot of research, the semiconductor industry in general. And actually I got a friend from high school. He's a DRAM system engineer at Micron. And he's been working there for just three months. So he's not really familiar with everything, but we all know like DRAM markets is really like cyclical. And like reading through Micron's latest earnings, it seems like the margins and revenue are just going down. So if you could walk us through some of the decision-making criteria that we have for specifically Micron, because we got perhaps other options that are not as capital heavy, not as capital intensive in AMD and NVIDIA, for example, that while they also are subject to some cyclical nature of the industry, at least so far, it seems like their are margins income are holding up better than money. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a good question. And one thing we should always keep in mind in investing is that there's a very high error rate, at least 40% and uh, could be even 50% or more. And uh, even with being wrong on half the bets, one can do really well. Micron is a case where we're not really going to know whether the bet worked or not until the dust settles. So we got to let the bet play out. But, but I would just say this, that the cyclicality of the memory business has gone down a lot. DRAMs used to be a terrible business. Uh, there were more than a dozen players. It's now down to three players. Uh, three players have over 95% of the market. And one of the things I had, I had a discussion uh, a while back with Charlie Munger, I didn't directly discuss Micron with him, but I discussed oligopolies and, and especially oligopolies where they can't. So one of the things about oligopolies is that if you're, let's say Coke and Pepsi, you can't sit in a room and set prices. That's kind of antitrust violation and all kinds of other illegal behavior. But as long as you don't, you don't engage in a whole bunch of irrational act actions. Oligopolies can do really well. So I asked Charlie about kind of the nature of oligopolies. And he said that Buffett had studied a long time ago, Coke and Pepsi bottler in wide number of regions in the U.S. and around the world. And he found that in probably 95 or 97% of cases, both the bottlers made good money. Basically, it's these are strong brands and people have preferences and such. It's not infinite pricing power. If Pepsi is on sale and Coke is really expensive, you might switch. But in some geographies, maybe the three to 5% of geographies, the one of the owners decided that they wanted a much larger market share. And so they engaged in price wars and a lot of other behavior to try to take market share. And of course, the your competitor is going to react to that. And so you ended up in some markets where nobody made money, neither the Coke bottler nor the Pepsi bottler. They were just bashing each other, trying to get market share. Nothing really happened. The consumer won, basically. But in 
95 or more percent of the market, there was rational behavior and there was no collusion or illegal behavior in these markets, but both players made money. And what I see with Micron and Hynix and Samsung is that I was really surprised originally when I was looking at the businesses about the frequency with which they speak to the markets. They seem to like, if they have the quarterly calls, then they'll have some investor conference and they'll do updated guidance. So there's a lot of stuff going on. It's just not four times a year that they're telling the investing public what's going on. And it took me a while to realize that they're not talking to me. They're talking to each other. So if they go on a rooftop, if Samsung goes on a rooftop and screams and says, my CapEx is going to be 20 billion this year. And I'm, I'm basically going to produce so many chips, for example. Two days later, Micron will make a similar announcement from a rooftop saying my CapEx is going to be 10 billion a year this year. And this is the number I'm going to produce. And then the third guy, SK Hynix, would say that too. So they're really talking to each other and it's legal to talk to each other. United and American Airlines, American will reduce fares on some route and five minutes later, United will reduce the fare as well. So as long as it's not done in a room colluding and you're doing it through press releases or whatever else saying, hey, listen, basically the unsaid message is I'm rational. I'm not trying to take market share. I'm happy where I'm at, where I'm at. And I met with all three companies, two of them are in Korea. And when I met with Samsung and I told Samsung, I said, look, it used to be that Samsung was the low cost producer. So they actually have a, or used to have a cost advantage versus the other two. So I told Samsung that basically, if you wanted to, you could reduce prices to the point that the other two couldn't match you because they would start losing money and you could take more market share and we hurt them. So Samsung's response was that bad things happen to us when we go over 50% market share. So they said, we really don't have much interest. He said, our customers like to have second source. and They like to have large second source options and, and the regulators and everyone else will not look kindly upon some one of the three becoming 80% of the market or something. So Samsung said, we are at 50% and we want to stay at 50%. And basically the other two pretty much said the same thing. So now what's happened over the last few years is that Micron used to be always behind by a year or two and uh, they've caught up. Now, I don't know how long they can keep that. They've actually run ahead of the other two. They were a little bit of, a, of an edge right now, but I don't know if that's sustainable or how the other two will, what that looks like in three years or five years. But the bottom line is that we have three cooperative players, like 95% of the Coke and Pepsi bottlers. The memory business, there's really no you know, alternative to it, at least as far as I can see. Now, this is technology and there can be disruption. But the way software is written and the way the chips work and the way logic chips talk to memory and all that, that has not changed in more than 60 years. When I was, when I was going through my undergrad, I'm a computer engineer, and I studied the architecture of the IBM System 360. And later I was working on, I actually worked on firmware and chips and hardware and all of that and used a bunch of DRAMs and so on. Later when I studied the architecture of the Intel 8386, which was a chip in the late eighties, basically these two chips were almost, these two architectures were 30 years apart and there was no difference. They were identical. The only difference was size. And, and now if you look at computing today, I haven't kept up with it the way I used to keep up. You've got some changes that have taken place because of arm holdings and people doing specialized processors and Apple's doing his own processors. People are not taking off the shelf AMD and Intel products. They're trying to get more specialized. So there's been some change based on the nature of the computing they're doing, such as Google is doing and that sort of thing. But for the most part, these architectures have not changed. And it's unlikely to change in the near term and such. So I don't think there'll be a fourth player in this market. And, and I think even the NAN market might consolidate at some point and that might become an even better business. So these are all the theories behind why Micron makes sense. And once you get all this growth that's going to be coming from AI and data centers and everything else going on, self-driving cars or assisted driving cars. When we have all of these things take place, it's a tremendous surge to the, to the volume of memory needed. And we're also hitting edges of Moore's law. So things don't double every 18 months anymore. In fact, they're lucky to get doubles every 
four years or five years now. Based on all that, I think that even though these are high capex businesses, all three should do well. But we, it remains to be seen whether paying a high multiple for an NVIDIA or an AMD in the long run is a better bet. It could be. That's the case. But we'll see. Stay tuned. All right. Other questions? Uh, hi, my name is Shreya. Thanks for joining us today. I think my question is a little bit geared towards the story of you starting your own company first and then your hedge fund. What went into that process and how does it look like for you now having your own hedge fund? I think I think there is a misnomer about entrepreneurs. People, people assume that entrepreneurs are risk takers, that they are rolling the dice. And if you look at kind of non-venture backed startups, which probably comprise more than 99% of startups, probably 99.9% .9 of startups are not venture back. Your neighborhood Chinese restaurant or laundromat or the consulting business I had started and that sort of thing. So most businesses, the more than the million businesses that get started in the US every year are not venture back businesses. And the common theme amongst all, most of these businesses is they do everything in their power to reduce risk. So basically there's an asymmetry when you start a business where if it fails, you may not really lose that much. And if it works, the moonshot works. So that sort of asymmetry in bets is very attractive. And one should make those bets when one gets a chance to. So when I, when I quit my job, or actually even probably a nine months before I quit my job, and I was thinking about quitting my job, I basically analyzed the situation. And I said, okay, look, I'm 25 years old. I'm going to take on, I took on eventually about 70,000 70, in credit card debt, Visa and MasterCard were my venture capitalists. They took no board seats, which was great. And, and then I emptied out my 401k, which was about 30,000. And at 25, I wasn't, I wasn't too concerned about my retirement savings. So I had a hundred thousand dollars and I could lose a hundred thousand and I was willing to lose. Now the 70,000 in credit card debt at that time, this is 91. They've changed the laws now, but at, at that time I researched bankruptcy law and basically if my business went kaput and I declared personal bankruptcy, that 70,000 would get wiped out and it wouldn't affect my credit. I'd get a clean slate. And not only would I get clean slate, but I actually become a really good credit for seven years because I can't, at that time, the way the laws was, you could not refile for personal bankruptcy for seven years. So basically you become a very good credit risk because the Credit card companies know that, car loan companies know that if I make a five-year loan to him, he really can't go back and file bankruptcy because that's not open to him anymore. So I knew that I could just lose my 30,000. And I said, I'm qualified. I'm an engineer. I can get a job when I, when this blows up. And uh, so when I quit my job, my, my boss and his boss, they basically told me, look, when your business fails, not if your business, fails, but when your business fails, you can come back, higher pay promotion, et cetera. I said, wow, this is even better than I thought. I don't have to apply for jobs. I get a higher salary and I get a higher position if things don't work. And basically things work. There's a huge asymmetry because then you're, you're doing millions in revenue and profits and so on. And like I said, it's, if you study, there's a book by Amar Bide called the origin and evolution of new businesses, which goes into what goes into the minds of entrepreneurs when they're starting these businesses, he interviewed a bunch of Inc. 500 CEOs over 10 years. And what you see is a common theme that most of them thought like me, I didn't know that. I didn't know that there was this framework that people were using, but most entrepreneurs implicitly use this framework without, even though they haven't really talked to each other about it. And starting a business for the most part for me was low risk. Not starting it was high risk because I felt like in a corporate path, once I was married with kids and in my 30s or 40s, now I would have a lot more to lose. If I'm single and I go bankrupt and I declare bankruptcy, it doesn't mean much. I can bounce back. And so I felt like I had one open, clear shot and I should take that. The hedge fund, basically the thing is, I'm just looking to do things that I'm passionate or excited about. I enjoyed investing. Then I found when I had a few investors that it was to have this group that I was helping and working with, and they were a bunch of entrepreneurs. So it was sometimes they were analysts for me because of the some business that I was studying was in their area and so on, unpaid analysts, which is great. And uh, so then I just took it to the next step. I said, this can be actually a profitable business. And a hedge fund has a tremendous economics, in the sense that one person could be running, in my case, 
hundreds of millions of dollars, but you could even be in the billions of dollars and the upside potential is tremendous and uh, it's, it can be a great, a great business. So that's why I lost interest in my IT business. I got more interested in investing and I just kind of pursued that. All right. Thank you for the question. And just a reminder for the people on Zoom, if you do have questions, just raise your hand. That way I can know that you have a question because I'm not able to see if anybody has their cameras on, but yeah, other questions? Since we have two business questions, I'm not really a business major, but thank you for uh, answering those questions. I learned from Miles that you are a philanthropist as well, outside of the work. I was just wondering and curious why specifically you chose education and aiding or helping children go to the school and agency. Why education specifically as your philanthropist interest? Or is there any individual or personal story you would like to share? Yeah. So actually I found philanthropy really interesting when I first stepped into it. There are some similarities with investing, but there are also plenty of differences. One of the things you need to do well in terms of effectively channeling the resources that a charity has at its disposal is to have a combination of heart and head. So you need a great heart, but you also need a business head. And what I found at most charities was that most of them were run by people with great hearts, but they didn't really understand capital allocation and things like social return or invested capital or looking at two different initiatives and trying to benchmark and compare which one is better. And then you put more eggs in the basket that is better. I found it puzzling that people just did things more seat of the pants. And one of the things I always questioned was that when I, when I saw a charity which had 10 different initiatives, I said, okay, if you measure all 10, you're going to find that there's initiative number one that does the most good per dollar you spend and number 10 that does the least good. So why wouldn't you the next year cut it to eight initiatives? The year after that, to six, as long as the ones at the top can absorb more cash. But they don't think like that. I think that their perspective is we want to appeal to a wide range of donors or the annual report looks nice this way or whatever else. And so there's a lot of inefficiency in the way charities operate. I... My experience has been that education has such a massive multiplier effect. Give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. So clearly teaching fishing is more my up my alley than giving fish. Though there are plenty good to be done by giving fish, I just prefer teaching fishing so that we can get a multiplier effect. And, and I ran across this guy in 2006 in Bihar in India runs an organization called Super 30, which is what we cloned because he wasn't willing to take money from me. And I said, do you mind if we clone your model? He said, no, feel free. So he was, he was taking 30 really poor kids. These were kids making families, making less than $2 a day type thing, laborers, farmers, illiterate parents. And he was spending about a year coaching them and about somewhere between 90 and 100% of them were getting admitted to the IITs. That's the, from the MIT of India. And once you get admitted to the IITs, it's almost free to attend. because it's So heavily subsidized. So the difficulty is getting in and the coaching to get ready for the IIT entrance exam, which is the toughest exam in the world, is expensive. So it used to always be that the IITs took kids who were middle class or higher. And below that, you just didn't have the resources because the tuition fees would exceed or the coaching fees would be multiples of what your parents were making. So I just saw that he was spending at that time about $700 per kid. And what would happen is that the incremental earnings might be something like 50X or 100X. It was huge. Because once you go to IIT, then Microsoft wants to hire you and Alphabet and Apple and so on. And so you have a lot of career options open to you, which are not there if you don't go to IIT, go to some other school. So to me, that was a, a great input-output ratio. At Dakshina, we cannot do it for 700. His mom was cooking for them and all that. He was, and he was not scaled. It costs us about $3,000 a person. It's been about 15 years, so there's probably some inflation in there. But what the 3,000 does actually is almost an infinite payback because we've pretty much transformed every generation from then on for that family. And they've pretty much gone from zero to hero. So... To me, it was a no-brainer that we would have a very high return to society by doing this. And I have not come across anything else which I can see is a higher ROI, social return on invested capital, 
if there was, and I could figure out how to do it, then I would switch. So that's why we're doing what we're doing. Thanks for the question. Sure. What is the biggest setback of your career and how did you overcome that setback? Yeah, Marcus Aurelius was uh, one of the last lo- Roman emperors and uh, he shows up in the movie, The Gladiator, at the beginning of the movie, the old king who's dying and uh, Russell Crowe is his chosen heir. And then of course, all hell breaks loose after that. But he was, uh, he was a philosopher. He spent most of his life on the battlefield. He had a lot of injuries and a lot of illnesses and he had a very tough life. And he came up with a stoic philosophy, which is worth delving into. But what Marcus Aurelius basically says is that to encounter misfortune and overcome it is good fortune. So basically, whenever we are, and you know, what I have noticed about what has happened to me in my life is every time I've been beaten down or something negative has happened, or something terrible has happened, there's been so much learning and growth that's come out of that. I couldn't see at that time I'm like down and out saying this is terrible. And, and what I've always noticed is that the paybacks are exponential. So you can't see it at the time. But now I just submit to Marcus Aurelius saying, okay, when we encounter bad times, they're not really bad times. We just don't know they're actually good for us. And we'll figure that out later. So when I look back at my life, there were a few points which were low points. My, my parents went bankrupt several times when, when I was growing up. And my dad was a kind of serial entrepreneur. And every three or four years, his business would blow up. And my parents were very poor financial planners. So pretty much if the business was doing well, they lived really well and business blew up. We didn't have money for rent or groceries or anything. So it was like really pretty dire and trying to go to friends and family and trying to just have money to get by. And so there was a lot of kind of feast and famine going on. And when I was a, a junior in college, I would come to the U.S. My father was doing well. He went bankrupt. And at that time I was on a student visa and it couldn't work and didn't really have any job prospects to let a, like a year and a half of school left. And I felt very helpless. And I just thought my, everything's over. I'm not going to be able to finish my degree and I don't know what's going to happen here. And I was doing well in school, but that was a very traumatic time. And then a few days later, one of my uncles stepped in and said he would support us, which was amazing. My favorite uncle, uncle still. And, but I remember the feelings I had at that time. It was very, it was very sad and solemn. And there's been, there've been other times in business or running the fund in the financial crisis, we were down like 65 to 70%, but there were a lot of lessons that came out of that. There were mistakes I had made and those mistakes got seared in. And it really helped the performance after that. So I couldn't see it then, but we don't really learn from success. We learn when we stumble. Thank you for the question. Other questions from this this crowd right here? All right, I was emailed some questions beforehand. So I'll ask some of those. And if anybody in Zoom has a question, just raise your hand. So I sent out your 10 commandments, Monish, the other day. uh, Your 10 investment commandments. One of the ones that someone pointed out was, I don't remember, I think it was maybe five or six, where it was, thou shalt not use Excel. At William and Mary, that's a bit of heresy. Please explain, what is your philosophy behind that? I think for in investing, you should be able to do the math in your head. And if you need to have a complex Excel DCF model to tell you that something is a good investment, it is not a good investment. So I'll give you some, maybe some extreme examples, but there's in, uh, in, in 2019, I, made an investment in this company in Turkey, Resas Logistics. And this was a $20 million market cap at the time. And the liquidation value was like 800 million or so. And I was visiting them because a good friend of mine in Turkey, who's a very strong kind of gram type investor. I just told him I want to visit all the businesses that you already invested in. Kind of one layer of diligence already done because someone really smart has filtered through. So I asked him, is it a fraud? What's going on here? And he said, no, I have an investment. And the company just doesn't have great IR or anything. And they had a bunch of warehouses. It was very easy to value those warehouses. They were in very prime areas, 99% leased, 10 year inflation index leases to like Amazon, Ikea, Carrefour, uh, DuPont, Mercedes, and so on. And so there's very strong recurring revenue business. And then you could just look at, you could in six months liquidate the whole portfolio and have about 800 million or 700 million or 900 million, something like that. And you were paying 20 million for it and there, there's no Excel needed. And now the business in the last three years, 
the Turkish lira has been decimated. When I invested at that $20 million market cap, it was uh, five lira to the dollar. It is now 10 and a half lira to the dollar. So very strong depreciation of the lira. In dollar terms, we are up about, I think about 9x in the last three years. And so the company now has a value of about 180 million or so. And the liquidation value, they've actually improved. They've done a bunch of things which have improved the business. Probably it's over a billion. They actually depressed. It could be in normal times, a billion and a half or 2 billion. So we're still sitting at something like 10% or 20% of liquidation value. So you don't need Excel for that. And, and one time I was in 2006, I was looking at a steel manufacturer, Ipsco. And Ipsco was a situation where they made tubular steel, what goes into pipelines. And uh, they used to get these long-term contracts because some pipeline will take them two or three years to get built. So they want to have assurances of the steel supply and so on. And so Ipsco had about $15 a share in cash on their balance sheet. They had no debt and they had publicly stated that the next two years, their earnings were going to be $15 a share each year. So the stock was at, at around 45 and between the cash and the next two years that the company is saying they would make, and this wasn't like normal guidance. They have contracts with these pipeline guys to build these pipelines. So it's not like Apple's making some forecast or something. This is actually hard coded. And after two years, because it's a cyclical business, earnings could go to zero. It could even go negative. So my take was if we just hold the stock for two years, we'll have $45 of cash in the business and plus all the plant and inventory and everything else. I just want to see what the market values it at that point. I just want to see how Mr. Market's going to price that bill. And about a year later, maybe eight or nine months later, they announced that they're going to have one more year of earnings of $15 a share. They got some more contracts. So now we were in the money. We were going to be at $60 guaranteed. And the stock had now moved up to mid to high 60s. Mr. Market was guiding some of that. And I was, I was looking at it and I was thinking, what should we do? And it had gradually then over the next few months moved up to close to $90 a share. So within about 18 months, we had a double. And I was thinking, this is a good deal. It's a technical business. I think we should exit. And as I was running through that, math in my head, I woke up one morning and some Swedish company had made an offer to buy them out at $160 a share. And the stock had immediately gone to 152 or something. And I didn't even wait for understanding the odds or whether that would happen or not or what. I sold all the stock because I was almost ready to sell at 90 and I'm getting 150. And I don't know what these Swedish people were doing two years back when you could have bought it for 45 or maybe paid 65 or 70 or something. That's the way the world works. So I think the best way to invest is to, first of all, you make very few bets. You look for extremely asymmetric odd where you just know that statistically it, it might work for you. Now, even when you do all that, you may still have a 30, 40% error rate, but that's okay. It doesn't matter because the winners are so heavily doing so well that the losers don't matter. So I think that basically the, Using Excel is actually a red flag. It should give you a red flag when you are reaching for Excel because you shouldn't need it. You shouldn't need it to figure out if I'm looking at something like Micron, I don't need Excel. I can look at their sales, I can look at CapEx, I can look at their cash flows, and I can look at where the industry might be in a few years in terms of sales and cash flows and margins mm -hmm. and so on. And you can run the math in your head. It's not that hard. All right. Uh, any questions from the crowd or if we have a couple ones on Zoom. Alex, it's here. Hello, sir. Sorry for coming in late at big JB soccer game. Getting to where you were requires a lot of risks. And I'm just curious to know what was your biggest risk along the way? And how did you convince yourself to push forward rather than just stay in your comfort zone? We'll have to have you watch the replay because we went through a discussion on risk. I don't know right. if your peers want me to regurgitate, but I would just say this, that actually it's a misnomer. We do everything in our power to minimize risk. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to pick up, I'm basically looking for bets where the risk is low and the reward is high. And in auction driven markets from time to time, you can get those sorts of odds. Not all the time. Many times it goes the other way where the risk is high and the reward is low. But if you stay disciplined and do your thing and are patient, it can work. Thank you. Did you want another? No, I've got those. Okay, yep.
question? So should I Tiger? Okay. We'll, go, we'll go Tiger, then Tommy. Or do we just ask one more mind question? You said you basically have the numbers in the mind. So uh, I went through their earnings report. It's uh, but revenue from 8 billion to 6.6 to 4.2. And then, yeah, 4.2 for the next quarter. And then gross margins down to 0.6%. Then you can basically break it even. So obviously, that's pricing is not the price right now. But like, how do you see uh, Micron or just a DRAM market in general which is covering into next year? Because obviously, like, this is uh, next quarter, the result is not really on. Um, we don't care in any business I own, we don't care about the next quarter or even the next year. With Micron, basically, I think it's just destination analysis. Basically, the, what they think will happen in the industry is that the memory guys are making about 150 billion a year top line, all three of them together. And that 150 billion, they think goes to about 300 billion in seven or eight years. And we don't know that'll happen, whether it's 150 billion or 350 billion or where, where that number is, but it's likely to be around 300 billion, maybe higher. And Micron might be 75, 85 billion or something thereabouts, maybe 100 billion of that number. And so then you just say, would they be banging out something like 20, 30 billion a year in cash flow? And yeah, I think they could. And, uh, and by then the market might recognize that it's not the old DRAM business anymore, that these guys, Basically, even in downturns, they don't lose money and uh, they still skim through. The cycles used to be very high and low. We've already seen the cycles are already muted. So basically my take is, okay, at some point, if the market believes that Micron can produce 20, 30 billion in cash flow, they will value it accordingly. So who cares about the rest? The rest. So I'll give you another example. The company I invested in, it's in India and I, it's our oldest position. I bought this stock in 2015. It's a company called Rain, Rain Industries. And at that time, when we bought the company, the market cap was 200 million. And it's a very cyclical business. They provide parts to the aluminum industry and so on. But the thing is that I thought the, so this was a company doing 2 billion in revenue uh, with a market cap of 200 million, one tenth of sales. And I thought the odds were very good that they would come a single year when they're cash flows in one year would exceed 200 million. And just like with IFSCO, I said, when that happens, I just want to see what the market does. What is the market going to do when they produce 200 billion million in cash flow? And what happened is in 2018, exactly that happened. They had a year that they produced 200 million cash flow and the market took the market cap to 2 billion from 200 million. It was a 10 X in less than three years. And of course, by then what happened is I fell madly in love with the company and the manager and all of that. And I thought they would keep going because he was doing so many good things. And then COVID happened. And in 2020, it was down to, I think about 300 million or less in market value. And now it's seven or 800 million. But we think that, I think that it'll again go past that 2 billion. They'll again have a year where they'll make over 200 million. And this time I said, maybe I'll pay more attention and we'll see if we need to get off the bus at that point. But basically let's say that happens by 2025, three years from now, probably high probability that would happen. And if we exited at that point, it would be a 10 X in 10 years, nothing wrong with a 10 X in 10 years. Perfectly fine. Good for your health. So you say in general, you don't really care about next quarter or next year. You're Completely really irrelevant. I think the next quarter is when I run a business, I don't care about the next quarter. I'm when Jeff Bezos runs a business, his arbitrage is that he's looking out seven years. That people are not willing to look out seven years. He's making bets which may not pay off for 10 years. And so whenever you're making an investment, your framework has to be sa the same as the guy running the business. So the way Jeff thinks about the business is the way the Amazon investors need to think about the business. And if they don't think the way Jeff does, then they're not going to really understand the business, not going to be able to hold it long enough, are going to, for the longest time, Amazon had no cash flow. They're pumping everything into growth. And so if you didn't understand that, and you didn't understand what game he was playing and the long game he was playing, you wouldn't get it. So it is completely irrelevant to me what happens next quarter to Micron's earnings. It's not even a something I 
bother to look at. It's irrelevant. So really for you, like as an investor or philosophy, you don't really care if you're getting micron for 120 bucks a share or 50 bucks a share. If you believe it's going to 500 bucks or 1,000 bucks a share, right? After, after this, let's go to Tommy Tiger. I don't know whether we'll get to $500 a share from your mouth to God's ears, but I think we could get to a couple hundred bucks a share. Sure, no problem. And we bought in the 30s. And if we get to 200 or 250, he's buying back stock and so on. Then it's a decent return. It's the thing about Micron is not, it's not my, I would say, highest conviction idea. We made a 10% bet. There's nothing wrong with the business. It's a good business. They've got good management. They understand capital allocation, all these things. So my take is let it run. We got nine other bets and we want them non correlated. And yeah. Probably at the end of the day, what will happen is five of them or six of them will work. And maybe one or two might even have a loss and one or two might flatline or something like that. And if that actually transpires, we would have a massive home run. No problem. In the interest of time, I think we only have time for maybe a couple more questions. Tommy, I got an email from Jeremy and then we can have one more and wrap up. Does that sound good, Manish? Absolutely. We can go as long as you want. No problem. Uh, unfortunately, we have a club meeting after this and the cam is already giving me the death stare. So I do have to move over eventually, but Tommy. Yeah, so I just want to ask, you've experienced a number of cycles and market like crashes, I guess, in your career. Is there anything that you think is like unique about the one that we're in now or facing next year with obviously the recession? You know, people always think that whatever is kind of happening at the present time like this is the worst time. They always think that the present time is the worst. Trust me, the present time is not the worst. Okay. And also trust me, this too shall pass. So there's always doom and gloom at any point in time. There's always things you can point to. Uh, the financial crisis was a pretty terrible. The Great Depression was pretty terrible. The Vietnam War. There's all kinds of things always going on. I think the, the bottom line is that if you invested in Walmart, and stayed invested throughout the period, you did really well through a very tumultuous period overall. And so it's the micro factors around a business will trump the macro factors. So Turkey is a crazy place to invest with crazy monetary policy. Our best gains in 2022 are in Turkey. We're up on our investments, solidly up which you can say about our US investments and so on. But, and there's so much to hate about Turkey. Micro trumps macro and this too shall pass. Uh, okay. Any other questions or should I just go into the one with from Jeremy? Sami, looks like you have one. Hi. Thank you for coming and meeting with us today. I just had a quick question. Who is the best? I'm sorry, you dropped off. Who is the what? Sorry, sorry. Who is the best investor you and why? I think the, the best investor, I would say, would probably be Warren Buffett. Just uh, look at the length of time and the way he's compounded and the kinds of the things he's done and he's a learning machine and so on. So. I think Warren would be up there. Uh, do you mind answering the why part too? I don't know if you're- but I think Warren, if you look at him in his 20s, early 20s and kinds of things he was doing, he's been a learning machine and he's evolved and grown and changed significantly as an investor and gotten better. He's continuously improved his game and he moved from buying fractions of businesses to buying whole businesses to becoming a great leader to- managing this huge empire. He used to have more than 80 direct reports of CEOs reporting directly to him. And any way you slice it, I think if you, if you read some of the biographies on Buffett, uh, like Lowenstein's biography or Snowball and so on, I think you, those are wonderful books to read to get a good sense of who he is and why it's worth studying him. All right. Uh, thanks, Sami, for the question. Um, let's see, the last one was from Jeremy, who uh, sent me this Actually, as soon as you saw the, um, the announcement that I sent out, uh, sorry, a different Jeremy, actually. Um, but he said, uh, you know, one of the investors that, um, so I'm going to reboid this a little. So one of the investors that, that you know very well is uh, Guy Spear, who I know you're good friends with. Um, Jeremy said that Guy posts a lot of his letters and returns and just, you know, passes them all over the internet. But um Jeremy couldn't find yours and he was wondering, um, yeah, why don't you follow the same sort of, I don't know, I'm trying to reword this a little. How, how do you, why don't you do the same thing as Guy and post your annual letters, returns, et cetera? 
Well, actually, uh, he's not supposed to do that. So we have SEC rules that when we're running a hedge fund, they give us a lot of kind of light regulation. But against the right regulation, you cannot basically expose things like your returns and so on to non-accredited investors. And I think even if you contact aquamarine funds, they will ask you a bunch of questions related to whether you're accredited and qualified and so on before they will give you the keys to the kingdom. It may be that they're third parties posting his stuff, but I know that guy doesn't send out his stuff willy-nilly to anyone and everyone because that would be actually a violation of the rules. So if we were running mutual funds, then everything is out in the open because it's platform designed for the general public and there's daily liquidity and daily NAVs and all of that. But uh, hedge funds are supposed to have a curtain between them and the general public. That's what the SEC wants. Thanks, Jeremy, for the question, by the way. So any other last burning questions, Cam? Yeah, one question. Thank you for coming, by the way. When you sold Trans 10, how did you decide what to do next? I think it's, it's really simple. I have a simple rule that I followed through my career, which is that if on Monday morning, I'm not fired up to work, fired up to go to work, I do two things. Number one, I don't go to work. And uh, number two, I hit the reset button. So this happened two or three times in my career when I was working for someone a couple of times and I, I just moved to a different part of the company. But when I was starting my business, I was getting disillusioned with the kind of work I was doing. The company was becoming very corporate. The group I had joined used to be eight people. When I joined them and three years later, they were 800 people. So they had done some acquisitions and they also had a lot of organic growth. So my job description, which was basically no job description, became a very narrow job. And I preferred the good old days when you were running wild. And so I said, I liked it better when it was smaller and uh, I could see some opportunities where it was possible that a business around those opportunities could do well. And so I said, I'll pursue it because the risk was low. So that's why I went for it. Thanks, Cam. Any last ones on Zoom? All right, perfect. Thank you, Manish, for coming again. Two years in a row now. I, we all appreciate the time. Is there any last parting words before we all say goodbye to each other? Miles, I enjoy our sessions. I enjoyed the last one. So I was... Happy to be invited back and I enjoy our exchange. And I would just kind of echo what Warren says for many of you who are students who will be going into looking at different jobs and careers and so on is I love Buffett's advice, which is to go to work for people you like, admire, and trust. And basically in that definition is not the highest pay and is not the most well-recognized brand. I think it's important to look at who you will be working for and who you'll be working with because you spend such a large portion of your life with those people and you should be excited about that and the money and the brands and all of that is secondary with that thank you manish thank you everybody for coming those in person on zoom especially those who are technically affiliated with women married matt and alex thank you i hope everybody got something out of it and thank you manish thank you all right bye, bye manish.